Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Well, people are still uh, coming in, but I will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, my name is Sarah Carr. I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo. Um, and we're very pleased all of you could be here today. Speaking today, we have Francois Mosnier of, of Planet Tracker. He's gonna be speaking about should fishers be paid to fish less, talking about their, um, their blue recovery bonds. We also have on, um, for uh, during the Q&A, we have Jordan DiNardo from Marfish Eco Consulting Group, who worked on the technical aspects and um, of this work and will be helping to answer some questions. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you know, this is gonna be a very interactive webinar. The goal here is to get feedback on the blue recovery bonds. And so um, Francois would love your input. Um, you can send input through the question panel and the chat panel. For the chat, you have the option of sharing chat with um, just Francois and I, or also um, with everyone. Um, and it's fine to share with everyone. And we encourage um, interactive dialogue on the chat. Just please keep it to the topic. Um, so anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very glad you're here today. And Francois, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Great, thank you, Sarah. And, and thank you for, for hosting us. Uh, it, it's really great to have this platform. I, I'm personally a big fan of Octo, so it's great. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Francois Monnier, and I, I lead the ocean research at Planet Tracker. Um, today, I would like to, to tell you um, about... Um, actually, uh, today, uh, let's aim bigger. I'd like to imagine with you a, a world where the health of the ocean doesn't diminish day by day, but actually thrives instead. Uh, it sounds like a distant dream uh, for many reasons, uh, and a key one is, is overfishing. Now, overfishing occurs because companies are incentivized to fish as much as they legally can. But what if these incentives can be flipped and fishing companies were actually paid to fish less? This might sound absurd and very difficult, but let me walk you through how this could actually be, be a, a game changer, really, that, that we desperately need. So before that, uh, let me just tell you about my organization. Uh, I'm from Planet Tracker. We are a not-for-profit finance think tank. Uh, in brief, what we do is to investigate the risks and opportunities related to environmental limits, always from a financial perspective. Uh, and we provide publicly available research and we engage with investors and corporates to achieve change. So how do we end overfishing? Well, there are many ways, of course, but we've, let's, we will focus on just one idea today. And let's start actually by looking what is already happening across the world. Uh, this, this person here uh, is, is from Kenya. In Kenya, before colonization, fishers typically used a technique called tengefu. You'll apologize uh, for my pronunciation. Uh, it involved temporarily closing some parts of the sea to fishing so that fish populations could replenish in order to maximize harvest. Now, colonization destroyed this, but a few communities have revived since this age-old practice. And to be frank, the results are incredible. In areas where tengefus have been implemented, the fish biomass is four to five times greater than in adjacent areas. And that means that the per capita income of fishers operating near these areas is 135% higher than those who operate without restriction. Now, it's not just in Kenya that these sort of ideas are implemented. A similar example happened in Chile. Seven years ago, near the capital, local fishers decided to set aside 19, 19% uh, of the area they normally fished for marine conservation. 
the fishers setting aside an area for marine conservation, that's quite unusual. And indeed, establishing a grassroots marine reserve was a difficult decision. It cost them money initially, but it paid off with a rapid increase in abundance and the size of many marine species that therefore uh, led them to greater incomes. And since then, four more neighboring communities have emulated this success. And there too, in only two years, positive change has been noted with fish returning to areas that were they were previously absent from. In both the Kenyan and the Chilean examples, philanthropy supported these communities to achieve these projects. What I'd like to argue today is that investors should support this initiative. And this is the idea behind what we call the blue recovery bond. So here is how it works. First, you need to find an area that is overexploited but where monitoring is present and rules are respected. And we found 65 fisheries that on paper would be good candidates with the help of a consulting company called Marfish Echo. And I will tell you more about it later. Then you need to create a recovery plan that will state in particular by how much fishing should decrease and for how long. And depending on the species of fish, recovery can actually happen relatively quickly in less than 10 years. Then you need to find investors who would be willing to provide upfront cash to compensate fishers for the reduced fishing. After some time, fish population recover and fishing can resume at a higher level. Fishing companies then repay investors with a capital and interest through a levy on the cash. And this way, the interest of investors, fishers, and fish are aligned. And in our modeling, returns for investors can be high simply because fish populations can regenerate quickly when left alone. Of course, this is not a tool that can work everywhere. So here are some of the key criteria that we use to determine good candidates. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on, on this criteria and also some, some ideas that you might have to find good candidate areas. So for instance, um, you don't want to have this sort of instrument focus on a fish species that is highly migratory because that would involve a very high number of jurisdiction, a high, a very high, large area to monitor, high number of companies to, to focus on, et cetera, et cetera. So that's obviously important. You also don't want an area where monitoring is not in place. Uh, if, if there is a, a high level of IEU fishing, that's not going to, that's not going to work. Another very important factor is you, you don't want to focus on a fish that is very important for local communities, i.e. a fish species that is really important for the diet, for instance, uh, etc., etc. So there's many, many uh, criteria that a given fishery needs to fulfill to be a good candidate. And that's, that's what we've been doing over the last months, goes through some of these. I think perhaps the best uh, for, for you to understand is, is to, to go through a few examples. So we've developed a standardized framework to assess eligibility to a blue recovery bond for fisheries. And we scored a close to 300 fisheries uh, based on a, a public da data set, uh, the, the one developed by Fish Source. Uh, we used that because we thought it was the most comprehensive set of data we could find uh, to access scientific and technical information about the status of wild capture fisheries. Others could have been used as well. So uh, these are two examples examples on paper, uh, a good one and a bad one in terms of eligibility, right? I'm not here commenting on the fishery. I'm commenting on the eligibility to, to this potential tool. So blue crab is, blue crab is considered a, a poor candidate because simply speaking, it's not overfished in the North Atlantic Ocean and its management quality and fishers compliance could be better. 
Uh, so there's little incentive to significantly reduce fishing in the first place, and there would be uh, some issues in terms of compliance. So that's typically not a, a good candidate. Uh, in comparison, the Atlantic halibut fishery is a much better one. Um, it has a stock health score of five out of five. Uh, here it's a bit complex. Five out of five means that it's actually a stock that is quite depleted. Uh, because again, to be a good candidate for all um, instrument, you want to be, well, you don't want to, you need to be overfished. So it would be, this fishery would benefit from a blue recovery bond program. It also scored highly for all the other uh, criteria, such as com management compliance, fisheries compliance, etc., cetera, uh, which ultimately gave the fishery a, a high score. Um, so again, if, if anyone has a deep knowledge of this uh, fishery, or if you if you disagree, would be happy to, to talk with you as well. Uh, overall, uh, and again with with the help of um, our partners at Marfishico, we we have been through uh, all of these fisheries and found, as I said before, sixty five that would be good candidates on paper. Again, we've we've not uh, checked, you know, we've not uh, been in these fisheries to determine how how good our assessment was. It's all based on publicly available data. And this violent plot here shows the average of the criteria used. The y-axis is the score, so five is the best. And the different plot corresponds to marine ecoregions, uh, where MBS stands for Mediterranean Black Sea, uh, and then you know North Atlantic Ocean, South, uh, uh, South um, Pacific Ocean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, you can see that we don't have a lot of fisheries in the green or strong uh, candidate zone. But we have a lot more fisheries recognized as fair candidates and, and also poor. So again, this is not an instrument that would work everywhere, uh, and we're very conscious of that. Uh, this this figure here summarized the the slide before into a, a, a bar graph, which shows the number of fishery identified as poor, fair, and strong. Again, by marine ecoregion. Uh, what's interesting is most of the good candidates we found are in northern Atlantic and northern and southern Pacific Ocean. But uh, we suspect that the results might be biased given of uh, given the availability of data in these regions tend to be greater than, say, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, however, that's not something that we could have uh, accounted for in, in the current study. And here again would be a, a subset of some of the strong candidates that we found, so some of the 65. Uh, just happen here to focus on the North Atlantic Ocean, but that doesn't mean that all of the candidates are in this marine region, as I said before. Um, this is to show you how we summarized each. Um, so again, what I'd like to, what like the audience to 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 take home with is that these these are candidates that on paper uh, would be reasonable for such a uh, a program, and we are in the process now of starting an, an actual uh, assessment uh, of each of them. So if uh, if you spot any of these fisheries, or if you want the the full list, uh, we're very happy to to provide it. And if you have any comments or ideas, uh, very very happy as well. Uh, we're also looking for candidates that we might have missed, for instance, in the Indian Ocean, uh, where data ability might be an issue. But uh, if any of you has any uh, better data, uh, that would be helpful as well. Um. You could help as well if that's something that you're interested in. Um, I'd like to share a tool that we developed. Uh, that's that's literally for anyone involved in a fishery, uh, regardless of your position. If you're interested in this type of project, uh, that's a tool to see whether a given fishery would be a good candidate for a blue recovery bond or not. Uh, again, with that bond being, um, if in case you've just joined uh, half halfway through. Uh, it's a financial instrument where investors provide funding to uh, to support uh, a recovery in a given fishery. And so with, with that tool, actually, you, you can uh, score any given fishery based on the criteria that we've uh, that have been that, that have been through earlier. And at the end of the day, at the end um, of the not the day, at the end of the scoring, it will tell you uh, the score of a, a given fishery. So um, I was just uh, trying to be very brief uh, in this uh, in this initial introduction. 
I think the, the goal is to have a, a conversation. If if any of you have uh, want more details, uh, I will uh, very happily show some of the tools, the tool in, in greater detail. Uh, but again, the key goal of this webinar is to to get the views of participants and make it interactive. So so that's effectively that's it from me. Now it's uh, it's up to you. If if you think it's an idea that could work, if you know any area where this could work, or if you have any other question, I, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Francois. We have a couple of questions and then a comment that I'll read. Um, so and again, I'd encourage everyone to send in feedback and comments. We'll read a lot of the comments, but won't necessarily scribe them. So it's effectively anonymous to the wider or wider audience. Um, there was a question, what are the main reasons that fisheries in the Med and Black Sea are not suitable for this concept application? Uh, so I, I can give a, a very simple answer and I'm sure Jordan has more uh, to, to answer, but uh, I wouldn't, we wouldn't say that these fisheries are not suitable. Uh, this is not how we would say it. It, it just uh, happened that they they would not they probably don't meet many of the criteria that we've established. But Jordan, if you have any, uh, Jordan works at Markfish Eco and is a technical expert on this and helped us develop that. So maybe you have a, a better a better idea. Yeah, uh, for the global scoping exercise that we did, we relied on fish source to um, inform us on those criteria that we were using. And so a lot of the data from fish source was actually from North American ocean. So that is just really why you're seeing the data that you're seeing or the results that you're seeing. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan and Francois. Another question that we had is, has there been any consideration of the presence of fishery improvement projects in the eligibility criteria? Uh, I think the short answer is that it was not considered to be a a criteria in itself, but there's obviously a correlation between uh, well how well a, a a fishery would score on a on the given criteria that we chose and its uh, participation to uh, FIP well to a FIP sorry. Uh, so I don't know, um, Jordan, if you want to add anything else. We've definitely discussed it, um, but as the criteria stands, no. It's it's not included, but that's a really good point, and we might want to consider including that. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, another uh, comment question. Thank you. Very interesting. Could the recovery bond be applied in a region over more than one fishery with a focus on the no-take zones? Yeah, that that's a good point, and so uh, it's a good. Uh, it's a good idea for one specific reason where this type of instrument uh, from a, the financial perspective or from the perspective of the, the buyer, uh, so the investor would end up uh, investing, uh, there will be some, if you want, uh, overheads or friction costs or no matter how, how you want to call them, which means that you need a specific uh, size uh, to make this work on paper. So on paper, from a you know simple uh, Excel spreadsheet, we can make this work, uh, in, including some of these additional cost of you know monitoring the cost of uh, setting up the bonds. Uh, there would be some due diligence, legal fees, except consulting fee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it doesn't work, of course, for a fishery that would just be I don't know uh, a few thousand. Uh, <laughs> few thousand dollars a year, definitely a few hundreds of thousands, probably even. So um, the going for several fisheries in, a, in an entire region has the advantage of scale, but it has the disadvantage of including more, more species. So with additional difficulties monitoring each of them, it has the probably the, the disadvantage of including more stakeholders and they all need to be on board um, Talking about fishing companies, a big issue with this concept is, of course, that uh, if on paper, let's say, all the participants say yes, and one of them eventually just, you know, go berserk and engage in IU fishing, well, it doesn't work anymore. So that risk increases with uh, the the number of participants involved. So it's a uh, it's a balance that needs to be found, really. Okay, thank you. Um... 
let's see, a comment that came in during the presentation. Um, the first thing that comes to mind in this very thoughtful approach is competition. In situations where imported fish created a race to the bottom, I don't think this would work, absent a tariff on imports to level the playing field. So I would add competition to the score sheet. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And I think we, we kind of, we have discovered, and Jordan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's in terms of uh, to what extent the, the fish species is part of a highly internationalized supply chain uh, and where, well, it's implicitly that's, that's covering competition, but I, I see what you mean. Um, I don't know, Jordan, if I if you if you want to add anything else, but uh, it's a good point. Yes, again, it's a balance. Uh, how do you measure competition? Um, we wanted to have indicators that are uh, simple enough and uh, measurable enough. Um, we could go with you know twenty five different indicators, but if we can't find a way to have a quantitative uh, metric for each of them, then it becomes a little bit uh, irrelevant. And what I would add as well, and sorry for uh, spending too much time on this, but it's we found uh, a high correlation between some set of indicators, meaning some some of them are actually irrelevant, especially you, you could get rid of those for which you don't, don't find the relevant data because they correlate very well with, with others for which we have data, if that makes sense. Uh, Sarah, you're on mute. I see your lips moving, sorry. Yes, yes, I was on mute. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, let's see. In your tool, high overfish score, score and high compliance score seem to be contradictory. How do you explain that? Okay, yes. Um, again, I'll, uh, I'm not sure it depends what's the contradiction seen about, uh, what's the contradiction here in, in the opinion of the person who asked, but uh, one thing that is a little bit difficult here is that a good score for this bond is actually a bad uh, status of the fishery. So that might be where the contradiction is. And uh, what we wanted to emphasize as well is that there are fisheries in which uh, the fishery indeed is overfished, even though fishers comply very well with the rules. It just happens that the rules are not set at the right level. I think that's what the question is about. And if I missed something again, uh, I, I should have introduced myself in more detail. My background is in uh, is in finance and also uh, uh, you know env as an environmental consultant not as a fisher. So uh, that's that's where that's where Jordan is rescuing me. Okay, thank you. Um and do we have your email address, Francois? Or I'll post it in the chat for people to contact you afterwards. Yes, of Just course, to let yes. everyone know they will be receiving all the comments um in the chat and the questions um after the webinar. So they'll have all this. Um, okay. So moving on, let's see. Hi, are all the potential fisheries in your list industrial or, or large scale fisheries? Thanks. Um, so I think the answer is yes uh, for a data availability issue. Um, no, I don't remember the name of each of the 65 by heart, but I'm pretty sure this is the case. And feel free to correct me, Jordan. Yeah, no, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Another question, what is the mechanism by which payment from companies is collected once the fish stock recovers? Yeah, so that, that's a, a great question. And uh, don't want to be too prescriptive here and it could take many forms. Uh, one key driver of this would be how many companies are on, on board. Um, in our initial um, proposition, the simplest idea would be because these companies would be highly monitored and there will be a transparency on the catch, then it will be relatively straightforward to apply a straight uh, levy on the catch, like percentage of catch, say for every ton, an extra, I'm just making this up right now, 50 $50 per ton would be returned to uh, the initial investors. That's an initial way. It doesn't have to be this way. It could be set as a, a lump, the same way that investors would provide a lump sum of money upfront. It could be a fixed amount after X years. Uh, 
it really depends on how the the bond is structured so it's difficult for for me to tell you this is definitely the best way because there's no best way right now it will be case specific right thank you um see it seems that the definition of fishery is species based but mixed fisheries would seem to need a different calculation to evaluate potential thoughts on this yes uh we use the we use the fish source as a data set, um, so uh, uh, implicitly their definition as well. Um, I don't know what would be the implications of, extra implications of looking at different species, well, multi-species, except the one we've already talked about. I don't know, Jordan, if you have any idea. I, I don't see any anything else. No, okay. Okay. Um, another question. Thank you for your presentation. May I ask if you could clarify on the funding mechanism as to how coupons for investors are funded? Additionally, any plans to examine freshwater fisheries as potential sites for the blue bond? Okay, uh, so that's a great point um, that I omitted to mention. On the second question, uh, yes, that could work as well. Uh, Again, here it's a question of uh, data availability, but there could be there could be freshwater fisheries that would be uh, very um, that that could correlate very well. So if anyone has any idea, uh, feel free to send uh, send it always. I uh, put uh, our email addresses in the chat. Um, and on the um, the first question, it it's a little bit linked to to what I was saying before. How money is returned to investor really depends. Um, on the depends on many things but say the risk profile of the, a given uh, fishery where the companies is related uh, that will is sorry located that will also inform how much return a investors would want um and so it could take different form it could be uh, as i said before most likely would be a variable um a percentage of every of catch every year, which means that the coupon would be technically variable, um, but uh, would be less of a would reflect also the performance of the given fishery, because uh, the last thing we want really is to be an additional burden on the fishery and people working there. Right, that, that's the overarching goal of this idea. If people involved in a given fishery don't want this, we don't want to be, you know, that NGO who are forced uh, uh, companies, companies and fishers to behave a certain way. It's, it's literally just the idea is that it's for the benefit of all. Uh, so a, a coupon that uh, reflects the operational performance of the fishery is probably the best, uh, the best idea. Um, investors might want to prefer flat. Uh, you know, payment every year the same. Uh, again, that's if we already arrived at this stage of the discussion, I think we are we are in a very good place because uh, experience on previous similar bonds, such as the Rhino bond, well, the Wildlife Conservation Bond issued by the World Bank lately. Um, I was involved in. Uh, I was working at a company that was involved in uh, the early stage of this. Structuring the financial details was definitely not the first thing you, you would do. You first basically need to agree on the framework, the, the structure, get everyone on board, and that takes a lot of time. Sarah, sorry, you're on mute again. Muted again. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> thank you. Ah, uh, thank you, Francois. Okay. Did the criteria consider the opportunity cost to the fishers slash how much it would cost to pay them to reduce fishing? Uh, yes. So uh, the way this was originate, the way we are computed this initially was to say um, what would be the costs borne by a company and therefore uh, employees of that company or fishers supplying that company uh, to reduce fishing efforts. The idea being, you know, why would a given company not agree to fish less for a given amount of time? The answer is obvious, is because of course you would you would uh, reduce your revenue and and your profits, your free cash flow. Um, and this is how we then estimated 
what would be the necessary amount of money that is that a this this concept would need. So that's the absolute bare minimum. It's to compensate uh, fishers for a loss. So if you made 100 in a given year and this will reduce your earnings by 30, you, ne you need 30 upfront at the very least, plus all the necessary costs, such as additional monitor monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. But it starts with how much is needed for this to benefit fishers and not just be neutral compared to the status quo. Okay, all right. Thank you, Francois. Um, let's see. What does management compliance represent? Does strong management compliance but poor stock health indicate that it isn't being managed appropriately? Um, Jordan, you have to help me on that one because I'm not sure about the definition as per fish source. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, stock health would refer to whether the stock is depleted or not. And then management compliance is more speaking towards is there appropriate management in place to ensure that that stock is on the road to recovery. So those could be at, at one given time in opposition where one is depleted, but there is management in place that is helping that um, stock recover. Okay, all right, thank you, Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding of what you have shared is that the program would be more of a loan program than getting paid to not fish. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, be honest with you, um, the way this was phrased for the purpose of this webinar was to be a tiny bit controversial and attract interest, as opposed to just say introduction to a blue recovery bond. Um, but having said that, in the way this was designed, the we, we looked at uh, three different types of stakeholders. So uh, investors, uh, fishing companies, fishers, and also the wider environment. And, and the point of this is that it would benefit each of them. So in a successful blue recovery bond uh, program, fishers would be benefiting financially, I mean, uh, from, from that program. So effectively you could say they would get paid, but it would be indeed via a, a loan uh, to a company or a, most likely a series of companies. Thank you. Um, can we use this tool to determine the relationship between fishing effort and marine mammal bycatch? I think the short answer is no. Um, one of the criteria that we use is indeed uh, bycatch. Um, if a given fishery is a very good candidate, but the a, existence itself of that fishery re, uh, results in a very high bycatch of uh, marine mammals, this instrument would not help reduce that. Um, and so ideally, we would want to avoid this candidate. Okay, thank you. Okay, when fishermen agree collaboratively to reduce fishing effort and a recovery bond slash fund is issued to cover initial loss of effort, at what stage would the fishermen have to start to pay the levy on landings once recovery starts to occur? Or will this be determined when setting up um, bonds, i.e. when biomass reaches X level and then levy on catch applies, et cetera? Yeah. Also, oh, well, another part, what happens if no recovery happens? Do fishers still have to pay? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um... All of this would need to be uh, decided at the beginning. Uh, the way I would envisage this is that uh, finance here would act in its most noble way, which is you know to find projects in that case that are sustainable. Uh, and the point is that yes, investors would make a return and they do that because they will bear a risk. What's the risk here is that indeed the whole thing would collapse. Uh, how could it collapse if there's no recovery for whatever the reason? So in my personal opinion, uh, investors should bear the risk of this uh, of a failure in recovery, perhaps not all of the risk. So this would need to be decided how that risk is distributed. So typically, if uh, investors uh, provide money upfront and recovery plan was uh, set up, 
uh, and after three years or five years, there's no recovery at all in the fish species for any reason that was, uh, let's say, uh, completely uh, missed by people in charge of the recovery plan. I think that's probably a risk that would be borne uh, mostly by investors. Uh, if there's no recovery, because one of the or several of the companies that agree for that uh, particular instrument eventually decided, you know what, um, we want, uh, you, we want, we want it all, and want this money up front, and also to fish at a higher level, and that would jeopardize um, the success of the recovery. In that case, it's the fishing companies that should bear um, the costs of that failure if you want. So it really depends um, where you, you set the bar. I think the key is to identify the key risk and to define attribution in each case. Okay, thank you, Francois. Um, let's see, there may be some related aspects uh, from this question. What happens after stocks are replenished and regular fishing levels are resumed? Yeah, so uh, ideally, you then have a regular well you, you already have a very good um recovery plan that would should serve as the basis for you know the the future and would already tell you what what will happen uh, after after recovery is achieved um it again it's it's up uh for all parties engaged to to decide but it, it should be uh it would be terrible if after that um, there's again overfishing happening in that fishery. So of course, a long-term plan would be to have a uh, fishing effort at a, at a level that is sustainable. That should be obviously agreed with everyone from the onset. Uh, the detail of this, which metric is used uh, to decide what is the right level, that would be again decided uh, on a fishery per, per fishery basis. All right, thank you. Um, ecological scales for most species are much bigger than jurisdictional scales. Does this rule out a lot of candidate fisheries? Are there precedents for aggregating across ecologically connected jurisdictions in a way that means each jurisdiction has their own bond deal and the investor expects that overall that the recovery will be achieved, even if some don't work out very well? Yeah, that's a great, uh, it's a great question. And again, I think it, it's, uh, it's a balance. Um, some jurisdiction that probably would be ruled out would be uh, those that are very uh, tiny in a ge geographical area as a, as a result of what you've just said. Uh, but unless the, the value of the catch is so high is that it justifies everything else. Uh, in terms of you know making the bond work and fitting all the criteria, I think here again it's a balance. Of, I don't know, Jordan, you have a higher understanding of ecology than me, so I don't know if if I'm missing anything. And sorry to put you on the spot every time. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, this one is a big one because um, this also it also makes me think about um, the impacts of climate change and how maybe a stock could. Um, move their spatial distribu distribution may change which then other nations or other fisheries can then start to fish on that that target species so that definitely needs to be acknowledged in some way and considered in the criteria but yeah for for species that expand the the jurisdictions that's a tough one <laughs> okay thank you Jordan and um, thank you Francois let's see um, let's see. All right. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Do you think applying recovery bonds for shared stocks can work? Shared stocks, multi fisheries, multi fleet is the nature of Mediterranean fisheries. Yes, that's something that we touched about uh, already. Uh, I think uh, in theory, yes. In practice, it probably makes it more uh, difficult unless. Uh, and correct me if I'm saying something wrong, but unless it's the, it's the same actors that target, so, you know, same vessels uh, involved, same companies involved, uh, same, um, um, well, not regulation, but same, yeah, same monitoring if you want. If it's basically the same actors that are involved for these 
multiple species, then then it makes it easier. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Um, somebody said to clarify, it seems like the fishers will later pay back the money through some sort of tax on their catch, or would it be consumers paying that tax later on? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, is a good question. Um, so it it's probably a function of which uh, type of, of fishery is uh, is involved. Uh, as we highlighted before, the one that we found so far, industrial one. So we're talking about companies mostly. So definitely, fishers uh, not paying, as in the individual uh, working at or in a fishery would not pay anything additional that would be completely against the idea right uh, the idea here is to ensuring that this is a product that is led by fishers in their own interest but also for the benefit of, of the environment uh, so so uh, definitely not uh, asking fishers to pay less uh, more sorry um whether that would in that would impact consumer price at the end, it's hard to say. Uh, there are some examples where improved sustainability of seafood uh, price of seafood, sorry, has resulted in an increase in price. There are some examples where consumers accept. Uh, I'm thinking about a study recently showing that in the Bay of Tokyo, consumers accept a I think it was a 10% premium for fish that is traceable. In that case, you know, with the right level of marketing associated with this product, you know, you, uh, you could easily see a way where this could be branded as a positive success story, and therefore there could be a bit of marketing. Uh, does that mean consumer pay for it in the sense of bearing uh, the, you know, having an additional burden? Probably not, but it's electing to to support a recovery story. That's how I would say. But again, very much case dependent. Thank you, Patois. Um, What if a fishery species is impacted by climate change? Would blue bonds continue indefinitely? Yeah, that's a great point. And so uh, we've done a bit of work on that, uh, looking at uh, tuna in Indonesia um, and how the, the stocks of different uh, species would be will be uh, or are being affected by climate change and it really depends so say in the case of indonesia we found that you know some uh, uh, some tuna species would be positively affected some would be negatively affected so if you focused on a given uh, area uh, there would be a positive impact on some catches and, and some uh, a negative one on others by the way, in the case of Indonesia, we found out that the profit profitability of the whole tuna fishery uh, by 2050 will be zero because of climate change. And so it's important that climate change is factored into this uh, definitely. It could well be a way to alert companies that it's necessary to invest in uh, the recovery of a species to avoid the future negative impact of climate change. There's not that much that a given company can do to prevent climate change to affect uh, temperature of waters, et cetera, and everything that will affect uh, fish stocks. However, there are things that a company can do to uh, mitigate the financial impact that climate change will have. And that could well be, uh, the blue recovery bond could well be one of these uh, actions. Thank you, Francois. Um, what about the fishing supply chain impacts, ice, gear, repairs, fuel? How are they paid for the fishers to not fish? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have uh, thought about it in the way where you would need a given, uh, a good candidate would do, if you want, the least I don't want to say the word damage, but the least negative impact on uh, upstream supply chain. So these organizations that you've just mentioned, probably the best way would be to make sure that, uh, say, the given fishery does not rely on only, I don't know, let's say one local vessel manufacturer that would therefore, not vessel manufacturer, but fishing gear manufacturer that would therefore struggle for two or three years. 
Um, so it's, uh, again, it's a balance and everything would need to be uh, properly factored in. Um, it's hard to give you a definitive answer at this stage, but it's it's obviously a key concern. Okay, thank you. Um, a question came in, where do you draw a line about who gets payment and who doesn't? What about large scale commercial fishing operations owned by corporate bodies? Uh, I think in terms of the way the payments would be structured really is uh, companies that elect to participate in this uh, potential scheme. Um, I just want to highlight that at this stage, this is something that we are trying to to develop if there's interest, right? Uh, it's uh, it's not currently happening. So uh, the payment uh, for these companies would be if they've agreed to the blue recovery bond conditions and if they meet uh, all of the necessary conditions in terms of monitoring and transparency, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so if you're on board from the beginning and you've accepted the reduced fishing effort, then you get paid. If you are not at the beginning, then then you don't. Okay, thank you. Um, have you had any feedback from fisheries companies about the scheme regarding any barriers or opportunities for participating? Uh, so that's, <laughs> I have, but I'd rather, I'd rather say that at this stage, uh, the question, the questions were all about monitoring. I think, and uh, what would be the money to to be uh, to be completely transparent. Monitoring is the is the key, and respecting a necessary agreement is the is the key is the key here. So that's the the key the key thing. Um, we'd be happy to have some more feedback from fishing companies, uh, knowing that. Um, here and, and by the way it's amazing to have such a high level of interest and questions uh you can also send feedback that we will not discuss uh publicly so if uh, and that's the case often uh with, with corporates would you know we wouldn't want to disclose uh some of some conversations that might be private okay, thank you um, just as an aside, we thought this webinar might end early, but we have plenty of questions to <laughs> still to cover. Okay, um, where can we follow progress on this endeavor? Uh, where to follow progress? Uh, I think, oh, I don't know how to say that in a non uh, self-absorbed way, but follow our work. <laughs> That's uh, probably the the first stage. Uh, we will communicate. Uh, when there is a significant update. Uh, so the best way, again, is that I put uh, my fish echo email address and ours in the chat box. That's probably the simplest way um, for now. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see, another question. Interesting approach. I've not seen any requ uh, required relating to fishing gear type even though I could see most of the fisheries selected are trawling, bottom and midwater. Would this method also be able to target species targeted by bottom long line? For instance, Alfonsino, Barrix species and blackbot sea bream. Okay, so uh, the honest answer is I, I don't know about the species that have just been mentioned, so I can't answer that part. The um, fish is a little bit fishing gear agnostic, uh, because each of them will have different impacts and contribute a different way to, I don't know, overfishing, go fishing, bycatch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, unless I'm wrong, this is not something that would be a key factor. Uh, but J Jordan, I think you, yeah, you, uh, you agree. Okay. Yeah, I do. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. There are different types of subsidies already providing, provided by government bodies. Paying for less fish will be another type of subsidy. Or what is your recommendation for regulation of other valid subsidies? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, it's a good point. Uh, however, I'd push back and say hey, that's not a subsidy. Uh, subsidy would be public money. Uh, that So you and I paying effectively companies to, in that case, to fish. 
uh, here the money comes from investors, so from private uh, investors. It's private money. Um, if anything, it could support the uh, planned uh, implementation of the WTO agreement regarding harmful fishery subsidies, where some of that public money that uh, currently contributes to uh, fishery subsidies will have to be uh, scaled back or completely cancelled. Uh, my personal view on those subsidies is that it's it's probably difficult for a given government to say, you know, we used to pay you 100 a year, but we agreed to this agreement and we think it's the right thing to do, but that means we will pay you way less. Uh, our solution, uh, and that's a, not connected to this uh, project, but it would be to reallocate fishery subsidies to uh, positive, so if you could call that nature positive action. So moving from overfishing to supporting traceability, moving from bycatch, or, I don't know, uh, sub subsidies that reduce, I don't know, subsidies that currently uh, result in over exploitation and actually reallocate uh, them to some things that contribute to higher monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be a solution, but it's different with subsidies are about public money here. It's investment money. Thank you. Um, can you elaborate more on how to find investors who want to compensate fishers? What type of businesses or organiza organizations are those? And do you reach out to them or is it the other way around? Thank you in advance. Great idea, by the way. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Um, so here again, we have a lot of conversations already uh, with investors. I prefer not to disclose too many details to be completely transparent, but the interest is there definitely for this uh, project. Um, and the range of investor, again, would vary based on what shape this project would take. If it's relatively small and high risk, um, it would be probably restricted to some selected ocean focused impact investors only. Um, it could be also something where philanthropic money could help, uh, but that's not the idea, right? The idea is to have uh, financial markets to intervene. Um, with a bigger scale that would open up to different types of investor as well for with an entry uh, ticket that is a bit higher. Uh, so really it, it depends. Um, and so it's, it's again, it's too early days. It's too much early days to say at this, at this stage, but uh, there is a level of interest that surprised me. Although I'm positive, but still uh, it surprised me. Okay, thank you, Francois. Um, rather than using private investment in a 10 year scenario, is it possible to model shorter periods and use public funding to bridge the gap? For example, is it conceivable to have a five year long project cover the income gap for the fishermen? Would there be species that in five years would have had enough rebound to make it sustainable from there onwards? Corollary to this question, would public investment in the initial phase of the recovery bond make it more viable for private investment? Yeah. Uh... I would need to think about it uh, for longer than two seconds. But in theory, I see I see no huge issue with that, uh, except that you would involve public um, you would involve public money, which you know takes time to be unlocked if you want. Uh, and the issue of the let's do it only after three or five years is that uh, from, let's say this is implemented, I don't know, in 1st of Jan 2026, and the recovery would therefore start from that day. Um, the time it would then take to monitor it and publish the results, uh, share the results with everyone, uh, come up with an agreement, etc. This The actual recovery of seafood species versus the uh, the time that is scheduled, uh, I don't know, the ceiling is collapsing here, sorry. Uh, the versus, yeah, how much it would take time for the, from the perspective of blue recovery bond participants would be slightly misaligned. So uh, it's probably better to have a little bit of a higher time uh, than just say three, five years. 
also not many species can recover in just three years. Uh, but again, there might be. Uh, so I don't know about that specific issue. All right, thank you. Um, a comment and question. I think small scale fisheries would be good candidates here, but I assume the data is not great. Uh, do you have any ideas how to collect that data in general, or would it be on a case-by-case -case basis working with each potential or interested fishery? Yeah, I <laughs> I would just completely agree with the whole of the question. So I'd just say yes, really, yes. Uh, ideally, there would be good candidates. Unfortunately, data availability is not uh, I ideal. Um, and so it would be a case-by-case -case basis where a lot of small scale fishery would be screened out simply for like a simple mass issue, which is that the fishery needs to have a critical mass to justify the additional cost of, you know, involving different stakeholders, uh, drafting agreements, uh, or, you know, the bonds, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is, you know, an extra X thousand dollar every, every time. So that's, uh, we can't have just a very tiny fishery, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, another comment and question. Thanks for the presentation. Compliance is a strong factor, you said. Would you know how lack of implementation of the landing obligation, as well as a total allowable catch system, such as in the EU, can work with your bond? Uh, I've missed the beginning of the question, and so I'm not sure that I understood it. Uh, if you have, Jordan, uh, feel free to answer, but uh, I don't think I have. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say I'm not really sure at this point. Well, I'll simplify. Um, would a total allowable catch system such as in the EU work with the bond? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it all, it all depends on uh, what is, how, how do you agree uh, to... Uh, how do you agree the reduced catch really and that um, that can be again can depend on different jurisdiction and how people agree uh which metric is used which system is used so in theory yes but i would need to yeah we would need to double check well it, it's case specific again thank you um Question that's come up from several sources, and you've, you've sort of hit on it. But if there's anything else you wanted to add, um, how would you ensure that fisheries aren't just <clears throat> depleted again once rebuilt? Rebuilt, you'd be paying fishers in the short term to stop fishing, but presumably the fishing pressure will need to be permanently reduced. How do you ensure that doesn't undermine the program? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I think again, the idea is that the the recovery program would set a a strong recovery, uh, sorry, a strong restraint, if you want, for a given number of years that allow biomass to recover. And after the fishing pressure would be set at a level that is definitely not jeopardizing the biomass of this uh, fish species. So that's the key, how it's measured, uh, for how long, uh, and that's down to uh, experts of in in each case, but that's the general idea. And of course, that's the overall objective. Otherwise, it's just a waste of money and time to be completely direct. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Francois, and thank you, Jordan, and thank you to everyone for your very active participation and the comments and questions you sent in. Um, as I said before, all of that information is going to be sent to Francois and Jordan and the um, Marfish Eco Group. So they'll have all that. And um, some of you included your contact information for further follow up. And then uh, Francois put in his information uh, in the chat. And I hope all of you uh, were able to get that. If not, you can contact me and I'll put you in touch. Uh, but thank you, everyone. Um, this is a great idea. And I hope to see it come to fruition in the uh, coming years. And yeah, thank you, everyone. It was amazing to have such high participation. So thank you, everyone. And we'll get back to you if we didn't manage uh, to answer your question. Thank you. All right. Great. And thank you. And ha have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>